Well, we reached an apex in this conversation about change today. And you may think that it is the end of the road, but it is not. Uh, but it is an important part, an important intersection of this change because today we talk about transformation. And you would think, well, that's just a, a synonym to change, which it is. And so you would think, okay, this is this is the bus route that has led us here. And certainly it is an incredibly uh, critical bus stop. It is what we have hoped to, to, uh, to reach. And when you think about this transformation, you can see here as the list, there, there is somebody asked me this past week, hey, what, what do we, why are we doing this, you know, collection? What's the real heartbeat behind it? And one of those things is to realize together as human beings that we all, if, you, if you've been on the planet any amount of time and struggled through change, things to throw off the boat, things to take on the boat, things to multiply, divide, whatever those things are that God is changing in you, we all recognize it's not overnight most of the time. Sometimes it can be, but it is mostly an, a progressive uh, process. And so we've looked at all these, you know, preparing for it, getting irritated enough about things, starving for it, being motivated, having truth to play a part, God revealing things in our life. You've got to apply those things. Last week, uh, we we talked about you got to eliminate some things along the way. And so today we, we talk about transformation, which I think is a, a super, super important thing. Sometimes we can have all of these journeys and all of these th these this process and all these bus stops, and we can often miss the most important thing. When I was in seminary, I, I served in a little church uh, right in Indiana. Indiana is like Sarasota, Bradenton. It's a, it was right across the river, and uh, there was a seminary friend of mine that he was trying to you know do, have his first church, and he invited me to come over and serve with him, and we did and. And uh, I was in music, you know, my background's music. So his wife had a pretty nice voice. And so everywhere I've been, we've always made a recording of original songs. So we wrote the, you know, to, went through all this process. It's a long process to, you know, record a whole album. I, that shows my age. I don't know what they call it today, but, uh, you know, record an album or a collection. And back then it was cassette tape. CDs had not, uh, CDs had not come out yet. And so uh, so we did this recording. We were super excited about it. And we were going to use it as a tool for our neighbors to meet our neighbors. And so we we're going to go around the neighborhood and say, hey, we'd like to introduce ourselves. You know, two young guys are out, we're out there trying to build this little church. We're knocking door to door. We're going to say, hey, by the way, this is just a taste of our worship ministry. And if you'd like to call us, we'd love to have a conversation. So we went all through this process. And then, I mean, it's not even the music. It's the graphics on what they called back then the J card. I don't know if you remember that. That was the card inside a cassette tape because it's kind of shaped like a J. And so anyway, we, we did that. You send it off to the, you know, the producers that, you know, produce all the, you know, the, the mass you know, uh, not a producer like in Nashville. We were not that high level, uh, but they, you know, they send you. So you say, I'm going to order 500 of these. I think we ordered a thousand because we were really, you know, uh, inspired by the whole thing. And we got it back and the boxes finally arrived that day. I'll never forget. We're sitting in the pastor's office. We're so psyched about this because when you do a recording project, it's like four months later that you finally get the boxes of the actual one and they're shrink wrapped. And that even makes it even cooler. So like we took that, we took one CD out and we're like going through, you know, ripping the cellophane off. We open it up and we had the phone number wrong, <laughs> which was the whole point of the project. Anyway, I'm still not. <laughs> so let's review at this intersection why we're having this conversation. Here is the ultimate reason why we're having this conversation. Human beings are distinct from any other living creature because we have been created in the image of God. For that reason, in that moment when God created us, his image, we were created to be image bearers to the rest of the world. 
Squirrels don't do it. Kangaroos don't do it. Cactuses, cacti don't do it, right? There's no other living thing. We have that single responsibility. We give God glory by bearing his image to the world. So many things come underneath that umbrella. And so when we read, uh, we've been reading uh, Romans 8 many weeks that those that God foreknew, he predestined us to be conformed into the image of his son. So it comes up over and over in the scripture. When we look in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, we see another angle to that same thing. Speaking to those who have exchanged their old life for Christ's new one, we are told you have taken off your old self with its practices and you have put on the new self. There is not a period at that point in the sentence. New self, comma, which is this new self, this is being renewed. I put in that word, transformed, renewed in the knowledge. There it is, in the image of its creator. So when I read them, I'm like, well, I thought we were already in the image of our creator. But as we know, Adam and Eve contaminated that image to the world of what God had originally intended. So it needs to be renewed. And when you look at the word renewed, it is a progressive word. Otherwise, there would have been a, a, a uh, period. You have put on the new self, and man, you got it. So there is this sense of being renewed all the time and growing, as Romans 8 says, into the image of God. This is the one thing we can't forget. This is the phone number on the J card that you got to get right. What do I mean by that? We're not changing our lives to just be better human beings. We're not changing to just be a better neighbor or a better dad or a better mom or a better sister, brother, co-worker, boss, manager, a company owner. All those things are great, but they come under this umbrella that the reason that we're, we're leaning into change is that so that we can better reflect the God who created us so that the world will know who he is. The world will not know if we're not living a life that's in the image of our creator, if we're just giving them facts about God, they need to see God in us. Does that make sense? I think we have to be really careful in this day and age that if you went down to any local bookstore and you went into the self-help aisle, there are plenty of books. And listen, please, they're good books. They're good books. People asked me uh, recently, hey, are you going to give us some creative ways of, of these, these changes that we can make? And sure, I'll give you some books. Atomic Habits, wonderful book if you don't know it. Atomic Habits. You think that's like atomic. No, it's Adam, like little teeny changes. Like one of the things this guy would say is uh, resist uh, unnecessary friction. So, for example, I work out early in the morning. I do my thing early in the morning. And you think you wake up and you're like, ah, I don't know. That's So re- resist the friction. And they will put your tennis shoes out, get your workout clothes, lay them out at night so that you, you're one atom closer to, you know, that friction and resistance. We could talk all afternoon about all these wonderful creative things, but there's something I want to talk about today that no matter what book you re- read, no matter what uh, what self-help aisle you spend the rest of the afternoon in, we can't miss the why of we are doing this for the image of God, and now we can't miss the how, okay? So we're going to dive deep. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, I just want to give you a warning. If you're watching online today, I want to give you just a little bit. We believe that that the Bible speaks to all levels of life. And I believe in this day and age that you have either woken up early to be here because you really want to, not because you have to. 
I grew up in a culture, I've told you before, where you had to go to church. In other words, if your car was in the driveway on a Sunday morning back in the 50s, 60s, you were, well, a heathen. And so uh, now we're past that age of looking good, right? We're like, hey, I really want to dig deep. If you've tuned in online, it's because you're hungry for God and you want to go, you want the real deal. Here's the real deal when it comes to, to, to the Bible and this whole relationship with God. There are two worlds, the one you can see and the world, the one you can't see. We're not just to here to make this earth a better place. That's not the purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is to advance the kingdom of God because he is the king, he is sovereign, he is over all things, and he has given us a responsibility to advance the kingdom of, of, of Christ because Christ the king is coming back to reign forever and ever. Amen. Some people get excited about that if you haven't noticed. So. When we look at this whole thing about creation, we're going to pull the, 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 the curtain back and we're going to look at what happened before creation. In the book of Colossians, we are told that everything was created by God, through God, and for God. Every single thing, whether above, below, east, west, north, south, everything, that includes spiritual beings, Angels were created beings. They have no, they don't even come close to being equal to God. Even the mention of angels is such a, a topic that some of you are like, wow, that, that is something I don't think about. They are as real as the chair you're sitting in. Even though you don't see them, it doesn't matter. I can't see the Empire State Building right now, but it doesn't mean that it's not real just because I can't see it in front of me. Angels are real and they're created by God. Now watch this in Psalm 103. Here's what we learn a little about the angels. Praise the Lord, you his angels, they are worshiping God. You mighty ones, they have power. Who do his bidding, they are also on assignment. Who obey his word. So the angels are subject to the truth of God. What is crazy? My, my wife and I were taking a walk early this morning. I'm like, here is a crazy moment that I'm sure there's supposition on how this moment happened, but it is a, it is a moment that is so deep and mysterious that we can't understand what happened at this moment. The angels were created beings. The most beautiful created being, uh, angel, was Lucifer. Now, again, if you're not familiar, you're thinking Lucifer, horror movie, blah, 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 and all that. But in his conception, at his, at his creation, he was the most beautiful. Anytime you're the most anything, there's a danger. You're the most richest. You're the most skilled. You're the most beautiful. You're the most talented. You're the most whatever. You put most besides any, any, uh, any uh, human being, and obviously being, it's, it's a temptation. So in this beautiful arena of pre-creation heaven, what we find is that God was addressing this most beautiful angel, Lucifer, you were, watch, the model of perfection. The model of perfection. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were the most beautiful of all the angels. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. He was created till wickedness was found in you. And that's where it's at. That's the mystery. Like, what happened? What happened in this, this eternal Eden, this place of perfection where he was blameless, he was beautiful, he was gorgeous, he was pristine? I don't know. I don't know. And some things we don't know. 
But in this moment, he became contaminated. We find out his motive, at least in Isaiah chapter 4. And this is where we land in, in today. You said in your heart, God speaking to Lucifer, here's where the whole thing fell apart. You said in your heart, I will ascend in to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. This is often referring to other angels, by the way. Not always, but in the book of Revelation, the stars were sometimes angels. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the same. Testing, <laughs> sacred mountain. I will ascend above the top of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. I want God's seat. I want God's seat. Now, you compare that to, well, I thought we were supposed to be more and more like God. Yes. But watch, here's the key for today. Lucifer wanted to be like God without God. I just want that to settle in a little bit. He wanted to be like God without God. Now, now let's go to the self-help on. I want to be better and change and transformed, but that is not the goal without God. I want to become more sanctified, more holy. I want to be more uh, honest, more, and I want to have more morality. I want all these things because I know I am supposed to, and I also want to, but I also, I want to try it without God. And you're like, that doesn't make sense. We do it all the time. In other words, we're trying to transform, but I don't have time for prayer. I don't have time. How many times, oh my goodness, how many times does that light on my gas tank go on? I am, I, it, it becomes a sport. No, I can, I can smell, still smell vapors. I, can, I got a little more going here, and fortunately now, you know, the cars tell you you got, you know, uh, like two miles left, right? I want one that says, how many blocks do I have? <laughs> you got three blocks. You need to find one now. If it weren't for that, I'd run out of gas because I have. There's nothing that in us that says, hey, you... I want to go, I want to travel, here it is, from here to Phoenix, but I don't have time to stop at the gas stations. That's what, it, that's what it's like. I want to change, but I don't have time to fuel. Does that make sense? So Lucifer's trying to be like God without God. He is now, amongst many things, the persuader. When Adam and Eve, so... Um, uh, uh, Lucifer was thrown out of heaven. He was thrown to earth. And I know this is, we're going deep. In the very beginning, when God created, you know, uh, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. And the next thing that we see is that the earth is a mess. It's empty, it's void, it's a swamp. Because God had to separate, you know, the, the Spirit of God hovered across the deep, the waters. It was, a, it was a mess. God doesn't create messes. It became a mess at the fall of, of Lucifer. I know that's heavy. So if that, was, if that went, whew, don't, don't worry about it. We're going to bring it back to, to here. So when Adam and Eve came into the garden, they were coming into a place that already had occupation. Occupied by the enemy, Lucifer, Satan, different words. And, and he is the persuader. Now, when you think about, hey, what was the first temptation? Many people say, oh, don't believe in what God said. But watch this. John 8, 44 
when he lie when he lies he speaks lucifer when he lies he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies in eden he sells the same lying message he tells eve if you just take the fruit the one of the tree that god said don't take from he said, you will surely not die because God said that you would die spiritually. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God without God. You will become like God and you won't need him. It is the greatest, greatest temptation of human beings. Are you ready? It's independence. It's independence. Lucifer wanted to be independent of the other angels who obeyed the word and did his bidding. I want to be like God. I want to be in charge. And when I'm in charge, I don't need anybody. And I can be independent. I want to change, but I want to be independent of what it takes to plug into God. I want to be, I want to be like God, and I want to do without God. The moment that Eve plucked that fruit from the tree and broke the connection, she declared independence. I will become like God without God. The minute we, we pluck ourselves from God and try to be like God without plugging into God, then we're, we're declaring our independence. So I did this little exercise not so long ago. And if we can bring this first image up, I took a beautiful plant and I plucked it from, from its vine. And look the color, the freshness, the vitality of that. And then in just 24 hours later, I took this picture. I says 24 hours later. This is what God was saying, that if you want, if you eat from this, you're going to declare your de independence. And when you're independent from God, you cannot change at a long lasting, purposeful way. Sure, you can read Atomic Habits and you probably should. I did. I think it's some good things in there, but it will not give you the internal change. It will not give you the eternal change, and most definitely, it will not give you the purpose of that change to become more and more like God. Oh, you might go to work out on time, but those deeper things can only come from being connected to the vine. Are you following? This is so critical for us in a, in a culture that just offers over and over and over and over and over. When we are told that we need to transform if you look at that word, trans means like going across, transatlantic, right? Transformed, we're being formed, renewed into the image of God over a period of time. The reason we know this is left to ourselves. We understand we're going to do our own thing. Let's take the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, they said, hey, let's build our own tower so we can make a name, what? For ourselves. We want to be independent. You might remember Numbers chapter 16, for those of you who know the Bible, the sons of Korah, they were looking at Moses like, hey, how come you're in charge? We want to be in charge. We're the guys. How about Dave, King David, who had a heart for God? He said, let me take a consensus of everything, that all that we've accumulated so that we can look at all that we've done. And God, he got so angry, like, no, you didn't do anything. I did everything through you. You're, you're declaring independence. And then we find ourselves in the book of Noah where the whole world had gone nuts. And yet Noah gives us the clue. Watch Genesis chapter 6. The Lord was grieved that he had put man on the earth. And, and his heart was filled with pain. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the culture, the people at the time. Why? Because he stopped for gas. He fueled with God. He walked with God. 
It was a consistent, when you read this, sometimes I w- wish we'd get down in the original language. He consistently renewed, he consistently conformed, he consistently walked with God. Here's what day three of the flower looked like. You know the crazy is it, Hello. <laughs> Keep thinking I pass out or something. <laughs> I think my brain just went out. The crazy thing about day three is it didn't look that much different from day two, did it? Did you notice that? Now from day one to day two, that's a big change. And this is the, sometimes the danger. It's like here's I'm just one step away from God. Like, ah, oh, that doesn't feel right. But this step didn't feel too much different than this step. Now this step felt, oh, yeah, I knew that, knew that was a step. But then the next step was like, okay. Right? The secret, the secret, watch, is Adam, uh, Noah walked with God. You know, we become like who we hang out with. Um, If you hang out with the sun, S-U-N on the beach, you look like it. When we hang out with these types of things, it's just the way it goes, right? And so when you hang out, remember this in Proverbs 13, if you are in the company of those who are wise, you'll become wiser. You'll become more like them. If you're in the company of those who are evil, you're going to become evil. It's it's going to rub off on you. And the more you step away from God, the more you step away into this culture. Because here's what day four looks like. When you have a flower. Now it's starting to get a little toasty. Think about how that was at the very beginning. Jesus said these things. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man or woman remains in me and I in him or her, he or she will bear much fruit. Apart from me. You can do nothing. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about everything. I want you, when you go out to church this morning, I'm going to give you a little assignment. I want you to think if you can find an exception to this. Every living thing is dependent on someone or something else. You're going to come out. You're going to see bushes and landscape. They're dependent on the sun. They're dependent on water. They're dependent on other stuff you have to put on them. I never do it, so... <laughs> We're dependent on water. We're dependent on people. We're dependent on jobs. We're dependent on money. We're dependent. I mean, we're dependent on stuff, right? Everything is dependent on something. So watch. God has created, has put you in an incubator of remembrance. He has put you in a reminder incubator that everything around you cannot be plucked from its source. So we go to the bookstore, watch, don't miss it, and we get resources and we can leave out, we think, the source. There's a difference between resources and the source. God is our source. It's not just that we need food from the fridge. We need God who gives us the food from the fridge. And if we are going to change, this is what it takes. Well, here's what day five looks like. That's getting pretty toasty. Doesn't take too long. In Psalm chapter one, talking about the person that walks with God, his delight is in the law, the word, the truth of God. And on his law, his truth, watch. He meditates day and night, man. It's part of his fiber. It's not going to God's fridge once a week. It's letting it in. He's like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. There it is. Here's what day six looks like. That dang thing is dead. Let 
Let me just end with this. This is a heavy one, isn't it? I, I, under, I fully understand that. But we have to be careful when we talk about transformation and change. We're just not fooling around with self-help. Because otherwise, it's just going to be so frustrating for you. Frustrating. It's so frustrating for you and me. <laughs> I feel like this message is three times as long. I've said it three times. <laughs> it's... It's, it can just be frustrating, and we keep failing, and we keep failing, and we keep failing because we keep trying to drive to Phoenix without stopping for gas. It's just that simple. So when people come to me and say, hey, I really, wanna, I really want to, to change, I will always ask, tell me about your gas stops. Because it's not everything. We need practical things. But to take that inventory of saying, are you praying more than two minutes? Because that's the average across the U.S. of evangelicals. We're trying to be like God without God. We're trying to say, I can grow this flower attached from the vine. And Jesus said, if you remain in me, meditating day and night, and the more you do that, here's something super cool. All of a sudden, you will see the power of God making change in your life rather than your human trying to make a change in your life. Allow the power of God to bring about change in your life, but you have to stick with him and walk with him and fuel up with him enough for that to manifest itself because your enemy who lied in the garden is still lying to you. We end on this exclamation point. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the reason that Jesus appeared, the Son of God appeared, was to destroy the devil's work which is to be independent of God. So let's compare day one and day seven. Day one is a plant that is attached to the vine. That's true change. Let me pray with you. Thank you, Father, for this uh, Reminder, it's heavy reminder today, God, but it's certainly a, a reality reminder, especially in this day and age where there's a lot of snake oil. And that mean that literally. So, Father, help us to not be fooled by the liar, just to say it out that we can grow and transform and have all these conversations, but we forgot the phone number of who to call. And when our world can be full of resources and we can forget the source. And as we walk out of this building today and in the incredible creation that you've made, help us to see, oh, that tree is still dependent on water and sun and that plant, and that child, and, and that lizard, and the, all the things that will, that will come into our mind, that everything is dependent on something, and you remind us of that. And this, there's something that old nature wants us to continue to pluck the fruit and be independent of the vine, and we wither. Today, Father, I wonder for those here today that have exchanged their old life for your new one, renewing that new life into the, your image, if there are those that would say, okay, God, got it. I'm, I'm four steps away. I've stepped away and felt bad at first, but I kept stepping. I'm withered today, God. I'm trying on my own today. I'm smart. I'm articulate. I'm talented. I'm healthy. All the things that just help us to feel more independent.
and it's a lie. I wonder how many today would say, oh, that's it. I can't believe that lie anymore, God. I come running to you to walk with you. I come running to you to walk with you, God. Put me back in the vine. Reattach me to the vine today. I wonder if, who's praying that, God, today. I have loved you, God, and my, I have loved you in the past, and I've lost some of that. I've withered. That love has withered. That vitality has withered. My walk has withered. And God, today, I'm reattaching. Here I am. I want the power that you can give working and bringing about change. I have tried it on my own too much. I wonder who's praying that today. Father, we pray for those who have never been in that at that intersection of the exchange from the old to the new. Who even when they hear the words, there's something inside of them that says, I want that. I want you, God. I don't want all the religious trappings that often come with humans version of who you are. God, I want you. I want you. I wonder if that deeply resonates with you. And once again, God does what we cannot do. We, Jesus just said it, apart from me, you can do nothing. And apart from Christ, you cannot find God. I know that's, for some, that seemed limited, maybe even narrow-minded. But there was only one Lamb of God who walked this earth without sin, who could lay himself on a cross to shed his blood for the forgiveness, the cleaning of our sin. And he offers you of all people. He offers me of all people an extended hand and says, come to me, all you. <laughs> that are withered, that are weary, that are tired. That's our savior making a way for you to do what you cannot do. You cannot save yourself. You cannot read a hundred self-help books and be right with God. You need him. You need a savior. It's profound and simple. In this moment, if you're deeply resonating with that, it's God calling you. It's God drawing you. Would you give your life to him? Would you come right now and say, God, here's the honest truth. I'm broken. I'm imperfect. I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I need Jesus Christ. I need you, God. I want you. I'm withered. I want to be brought to life. God, I am in so need of you that right now I just say, here I am. Is that your prayer? Whatever I'm trusting in, myself, my efforts, religion, coming to a church, whatever it is, I set it aside and I trust in Christ alone right now. Is that your prayer? Say it boldly in your heart to him if you've never been at this intersection. I trust in Christ right now. Be my savior. Exchange this old life for your new one. I want your new life, God, in me. I want to be at peace with you, God. Is that your prayer? Speak to him, your words, not mine, your words. I'm asking God for a new life. Father, thank you so much for Jesus Christ, for being the type of father that provides the things that we could never achieve for coming to us in such a brilliant and loving way. 
We love you today, God. We need you. You are the vine. Oh, and we need you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.